Hi, my name is Alyssa Waga. My group and I are happy to be sharing this presentation with you all on when it is the appropriate time to call your child's pediatrician. There is a lot of information, education, and work that goes into parenting a child, and obviously children do not come with a step-by-step -step manual on how to care for them. A lot is left up to the parents to learn and figure out for themselves as they go. And although this can be a very rewarding experience for parents, it can also be extremely stressful. Given that children at their young age do not always know or are not always capable of properly communicating themselves and the pain that they are experiencing, parents are often left scrambling to figure out whether or not their child's symptoms warrant a visit to the pediatrician or even the hospital. In this presentation, my group and I cover signs and symptoms that may indicate that your child's condition requires a call to the pediatrician. Maggie, take it away. Thanks, Alyssa. While fevers are typically able to be treated at home with rest and over-the-counter medications, there are definitely some guidelines to keep in mind if you know that your child is experiencing one. For newborns, rectal temperatures of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or higher accompanied by vomiting, diarrhea, strange rashes, stiff neck, sore throat, or a seizure, demands a call to the pediatrician immediately. For children anywhere between three months to three years old, if they are experiencing rectal temperatures anywhere between 100 to 103 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours or more, they need to be seen by a pediatrician. If your child is three years or older, an oral temperature of 103 degrees Fahrenheit or higher indicates that they need to be seen by a pediatrician. For children any older than three years old, an oral temperature of 102 degrees Fahrenheit for more than two days will require a visit to the pediatrician. In terms of over-the-counter medications and home remedies that can be used to treat fevers, these are some possibilities. Administer Tylenol to attempt to lower the child's temperature. Make sure that you are using infants or children's Tylenol depending on the child's age. Give your child a lukewarm bath, not too hot and not too cold. Make sure that your child is staying hydrated and drinking plenty of fluid. Juice and water are recommended. Ensure that your child is receiving plenty of bed rest. You can give your child an anti-fever such as acetaminophen or ibuprofen, but never give a child aspirin as it has been linked to a fatal disease known as Ray syndrome. It is important to note that before resorting to any of these treatments, it is in the parent and child's best interest to consult with their pediatrician first to figure out the best and safest plan of action. Infants under two months of age should not be given medication for a fever. If you are ever unsure, call your pediatrician. If parents note that a fever is accompanied by any of these symptoms, you need to visit the emergency department immediately. Breathing issues, extreme abdominal pain, seizures, and trouble swallowing. Here is a sample case study. Melody is a two-year-old girl with a rectal temperature of 101.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Should her mother call the pediatrician? The answer is yes. For children between the ages of three months to three years old, if their temperature is anywhere between 100 to 103 degrees Fahrenheit, you should call the pediatrician.
When should I call the pediatrician regarding concerns about my child's diet? Leah? Good question, Maggie. I'm going to be talking about when to call your pediatrician as it relates to diet and bowel issues. If your child is ill, vomiting can be a relatively normal experience that may last anywhere between three to four hours. The child may eventually become more stable and change to mild vomiting. However, if the child's vomiting increases in severity or stays the same in severity, you should call your pediatrician. If your child is vomiting one to two times a day, call the pediatrician. The biggest threat caused by vomiting is dehydration. Watch your child for urine that is dark yellow in color, dry mouth, no tears if your child is crying, or slow capillary refills that take longer than two seconds. To test this, press on your child's thumbnail, making it pale. Let go and watch the color return to a light pink. If this color refill takes longer than two seconds, call your pediatrician. Cases with vomiting are different for very young children and I'll be talking about that later. In terms of diarrhea and stool problems, similarly to vomiting, dehydration is the biggest threat when it comes to diarrhea. Call the pediatrician if your child has been experiencing diarrhea for more than two days, has a fever alongside the diarrhea, has bloody diarrhea, diarrhea accompanied by vomiting, or diarrhea accompanied by abdominal pain. When it comes to stomach pain, stomach pain can be very painful for children. Oftentimes, it can be a minor sign of another underlying illness. However, it's not possible to diagnose stomach pain based on symptoms by themselves. This is why it's so important to contact the pediatrician to get to the bottom of it when your child is experiencing abdominal pain. You cannot make those own judgments by yourself. Many times, stomach pain in your child is associated with minor problems such as constipation, gas, or something that you ate. Waiting a few hours, having a bowel movement, or passing gas may help. And you may not necessarily need to call the pediatrician for your child. If your child is vomiting everything, nearly everything, or is vomiting eight or more times a day, call 911. For example, if your child cannot get down any food or any meals, and is just vomiting it straight back up, you should be contacting emergency services. The biggest threat that comes with vomiting is dehydration, like I said before. This can be identified in children who have difficulty standing, numbness, weakness, dizziness, confusion, or trouble speaking after vomiting. And these are all signs of severe dehydration and they should not be taken lightly and you should be contacting emergency services. You should go to the emergency room if there's blood in the vomit or if you have other symptoms like a severe headache or, or if your child has other symptoms like a severe headache or abdominal pain, confusion, or fast breathing or heart rate. A child younger than six should be seen straight away if the vomiting lasts more than a few hours or if they have signs of the severe dehydration like I mentioned before. Kids over six should see a doctor if their vomiting lasts more than a day or if they have a high fever, which can be anywhere from 100 to 103 for some kids. If your child is experiencing diarrhea and if your child has gone more than eight hours without urination, has bloody stool, is experiencing high fever or unconsciousness, call 911. However, your child definitely does not need to be unconscious to call 911. If pinched skin doesn't go straight back straight away, this is also a sign that you should call 911. This is a sign of severe dehydration and it's something that you can also test at home. What you do is you take your child's skin and you pinch it. It should go back straight away, but if you pinch it and it's still standing even after you let go, this is a sign of severe dehydration and you should be calling 911. Also, a huge indicator that can help distinguish the severity of pain that your child is experiencing is if your child is verbal. And obviously, your child has to be at a certain age, um, but if you just ask your child for their symptoms and it, they express their pain in the way that you're not used to or in a way that they haven't done before, emergency services should be contacted. If your child is experiencing abdominal pain that you know is associated with trauma impact, call 911. If the pain seems sudden and intense, as if it came out of nowhere, you should seek emergency care, or if the pain gets severely worse out of nowhere. If your child is experiencing swelling or tenderness in their abdomen, 
difficulty breathing, or yellowy eyes, call 911. A common issue of abdominal pain is appendicitis. The pain of appendicitis usually begins near the navel. Within a few hours, the pain may move down to the lower right abdomen. Symptoms that appear after the pain begin include loss of appetite, a low-grade fever, nausea, and vomiting. In children two and under, the main symptoms are vomiting and a distended abdomen. It is common in children, so parents should be encouraged not to rule appendicitis out. Some other causes of stomach pain include bowel obstruction, which is when food or waste blocks the intestine, bowel perforation, which is a hole in the intestine that leaks food material. Here is a sample case study. Julian is nine, a nine-year-old boy who is ill and has vomited four times in one day. He's experiencing weakness, numbness, and dizziness. Should his parents contact the pediatrician or take him to the emergency room? His parents should take him to the emergency room. Vomiting four times a day is out of the one to two time normal vomiting range and his weakness, numbness, and dizziness are all signs of dehydration. What would you do if your child has been consistently diarying throughout the day and when you pinch their skin, their skin doesn't bounce back into place? The answer is you should call 911 for this child. This child is severely dehydrated and this could result in severe consequences, a common one being fainting. However, it can also cause permanent damage to the kidneys, heart, and brain. Okay, one last case study. What would you do if your child vomits one or two times a day, but every time they vomit, the pain goes down in severity? The answer is you should contact your pediatrician for this. It's a good sign that the severity of the vomiting has gone down and the child is only vomiting a handful of times in the day, but still you should get this child checked out um, and not just take care of it by yourself. Okay, when should I contact my, pedi my child's pediatrician regarding concerns of common childhood illnesses? Jillian? Good question, Leah. Children are often more prone to falling ill due to the developing immune systems. And though many of these illnesses are common amongst children, there are still instances in which a pediatrician should be contacted. The common cold in children will usually go away on its own within a week and does not typically require contacting a pediatrician. However, if a fever of 100.4 100 degrees Fahrenheit lasts more than two days, if symptoms don't improve in 10 days, if over-the-counter medicine is not helping, if a fever continues to rise, or if the child is having trouble breathing, call the pediatrician. It is likely that the problem is deeper rooted. The flu is similar to the common cold, except the symptoms typically start very abruptly. These symptoms include body ache, fever, cough, and being very tired. Children under the age of five are at more of a risk for severe flu complications. If the flu is caught early enough, a doctor can prescribe an antiviral medication to shorten the flu and help symptoms. However, similar to that of the common cold, if the child's flu symptoms do not get better after 10 days or begin to worsen, call the pediatrician. Children can get COVID too, so it might be the best to call the pediatrician to see if your child has a cold, the flu, or COVID, since symptoms can be very similar. Distinguishing the difference between the common cold and the whooping cough is very important. Whooping cough makes a unique whoop sound that is heard when the child takes a breath and is usually experienced in fits. Because of the vaccine, it is less common. But if your child is not vaccinated against it, it is good to understand the signs and symptoms since it is very contagious. For children under the age of one, whooping cough can be very dangerous. If you suspect that your child's cough may be whooping cough, contact the pediatrician immediately. Antibiotics may be administered as a treatment. Sore throats are often very common as a common cold symptom. 
but strep throat is very different and very contagious. Strep throat manifests itself as a very sore throat accompanied by swollen tonsils with white patches on them and pain with swallowing. Other symptoms can be swollen lymph nodes, fever, and tiny red spots on the roof of the mouth. It may be treated with antibiotics, otherwise complications may occur. If your child expresses that they are experiencing a sore throat, contact your pediatrician to receive a strep test so that if the condition is strep throat, treatment can be started right away. The most frequent kind of ear infection in babies is a middle ear infection, which is an infection behind the eardrum. Ear infections sometimes start with a cold and progress into a painful condition that results in children fussing and crying, pulling up their ears, and sleeping poorly. If your child is experiencing worsening pain, fluid drainage, trouble hearing, trouble sleeping, or symptoms that are not improving, contact the pediatrician. As for eye conditions, pink eye is very contagious. It might be best to call the pediatrician just to see if the child needs to stay home. Symptoms of pink eye include redness or pinkness in one or both eyes, itchy eyes, and clear white, yellow, or green discharge from the eyes that can subsequently cause eye crust, which makes opening the eyes difficult. There is both a viral and bacterial pink eye, which are contagious. There is a third type of pink eye, which is pink eye caused by allergies, which is not contagious. Viral pink eye takes about seven to 14 days to clear up and no medication is needed since it is viral. Viral pink eye usually has clear discharge, unlike bacterial pink eye. Calling the pediatrician is not necessary as they cannot prescribe anything for viral pink eye. It can be treated by using artificial tears cleaning the child's eyelids with a wet cloth and applying cold or warm compress several times daily. Bacterial pink eye can be cleared with antibiotic eye drops that can be prescribed by a, by a pediatrician. If the eye drops do not clear up the bacterial pink eye after a few days, call the pediatrician again. Pink eye may also be due to allergies like seasonal allergies or environmental allergies like pet dander and dust. It should get better with the removal of the allergen and you can use over-the-counter eye drops to reduce the symptoms. It is not contagious, so calling the pediatrician is not needed. You may call the pediatrician to determine whether pink eye is viral or bacterial. Sometimes calling the pediatrician is not enough and 911 is needed for help. If your child is having trouble breathing to the point their lips are blue or unconscious, or very difficult to wake up when experiencing any of these symptoms, please call 911. Here is a sample case study. Your child has had a sore throat for the last few days and is complaining of pain when swallowing and now has a fever of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. You decide to look into your child's throat and see white patches on their tonsils. Is your child experiencing the common cold or strep throat? Should you call the pediatrician? The answer is to call the pediatrician if you suspect your child has strep throat. This child is showing multiple signs of strep throat, which are a sore throat, pain with swallowing, a fever, and white patches on their tonsils. By calling the pediatrician, they can administer a strep test to see if antibiotics are needed for strep. By allowing your child to get treated sooner, you are lowering the chance of any complications. Alyssa, when should I contact the pediatrician regarding breathing problems in my child? We're asking, Jill. Children have different respiratory rates than adults and that theirs are typically a little faster than ours. The normal respiratory rate in children varies by age. The typical respiratory rate for newborns is between 30 to 60 breaths per minute. The typical respiratory rate for infants is also between 30 to 60 breaths per minute. The typical respiratory rate for toddlers is between 24 to 40 breaths per minute. The typical respiratory rate for preschoolers is between 22 to 34 breaths per minute. The typical respiratory rate for school-aged children is 18 to 30 breaths per minute and the typical respiratory rate for adolescents is 12 to 17 breaths per minute.
If your child's breathing rate is anywhere out of range for their age, or if your child gets winded more than normal after activity, call the pediatrician. This can potentially indicate conditions such as asthma. Respiratory rate should be measured when the child is at rest and is not just engaged in vigorous activity. In general, respiratory rates are slightly faster in younger people than older people. It is important to note that infants can also exhibit a phenomenon known as periodic breathing. They may have periods during which they breathe slower than normal, followed by a few minutes of breathing much faster than normal. It's normal for an infant to stop breathing for 5 to 10 seconds, then pick back up again on their own. But if it goes longer than 10 seconds or their skin starts to turn blue, call 911. Be sure to look out for these signs that indicate that your child is physically unable to breathe, which is extremely dangerous and can be fatal. Call 911 if your child is wheezing, as this may indicate that your child's air passages are narrowing and making breathing difficult. If your child's nostrils are flaring, as a baby who is having trouble taking in enough air will have nostrils that widen with each inhaled breath. If your child is grunting, this is a sound made by a baby who is having trouble breathing. The baby grunts to try to keep air in the lungs to help build up the oxygen level. Another sound may be a moan or sigh when exhaling. If your child is displaying cyanosis, which is a generalized blue coloring in the skin, this can be a sign that the baby is not getting enough oxygen. This is often seen in babies with heart defects as well as respiratory problems. If your child is less than one years old and is breathing more than 60 beats per minute, or if they're anywhere between one to five years old and are breathing more than 40 beats per minute. Here is a sample case study. Emma is a 13 year old girl who is breathing 44 beats per minute. Should her mother call the pediatrician? The answer is yes, her mother should call the pediatrician. The normal breathing rate for adolescents like Emma is between 12 to 17 breaths per minute. 40 breaths per minute would mean that Emma is experiencing tachypnea or abnormally fast breathing. Alicia, when should I contact the pediatrician regarding rashes or skin conditions in my well, child? Awesome. Children experience many of the same skin conditions that adults do. This is often due to the fact that the, their immune systems are still developing. Today, I will be going over some of the common skin conditions that children could potentially suffer from. For one, ringworm is characterized by a red, scaly patch or bump that eventually turns into an itchy ring. It typically has raised, blistery, and scaly borders. Given that ringworm is contagious, especially through skin-to-skin -skin contact, if you notice that your child has it or suspect that a rash might be ringworm, contact your pediatrician immediately. Your doctor may treat it with antifungal creams. Another common skin condition is Fifth's disease. Fifth's disease usually manifests as a mild illness with flu-like symptoms, followed by a bright red face and a body rash. This bright red face is often described as a slapped cheek appearance. It is spread primarily through coughing and sneezing and is the most contagious the first week before the rash appears. Because of how contagious Fifth's disease can be, once symptoms appear, call the pediatrician to decrease the possibility of spreading the disease to anyone else. Fifth's disease is usually treated with rest, fluids, and pain relievers. However, it is important to note that you should never give aspirin to children. Another common skin condition that isn't so often seen in today's children is chickenpox. Chickenpox is not seen as often in today's children due to the vaccine, but nonetheless, it is still very contagious. Chickenpox leaves itchy rashes and red spots all over the body that have a very distinct appearance. Because of this, once you notice the spots on your child, contact your pediatrician for recommendations of treatments that will help with minimizing symptoms such as fever and itching. Another common skin condition is empetigo. This is a skin condition that creates red sores and blisters all over the body. Sores are primarily found around the mouth and around the nose. Impetigo can be spread from child to child through close contact or by sharing things like towels and toys. Scratching the sores can even cause impetigo to spread to other parts of the body. As soon as you notice the sores, contact your pediatrician immediately to prevent the spread and receive treatments such as antibiotic ointment or oral antibiotics. 
Another highly commonly seen skin condition in children is eczema, also known as atopic dermatitis. This is a skin disorder that commonly appears in babies or very young children. It could last until the child reaches adolescence or persists into adulthood. Oftentimes, eczema causes skin to itch, flake, and turn red. Once you notice these symptoms in your child, contact the pediatrician to receive treatments like topical corticosteroids to alleviate your child's discomfort. Keep in mind that even after eczema clears up, flare-ups can still occur due to triggers such as stress. Eczema triggered by allergens as opposed to random flare-ups is known as contact dermatitis. The severity of this condition can be reduced through the stopping of contact with irritants. Although not contagious like the other diseases discussed, it is important to contact the pediatrician in order to help your child get better. Another common skin condition is hand foot mouth disease. This is an illness caused by viruses like the Coxsackie virus and other enteroviruses. It typically results in a distinctive rash. This rash can progress to become small blister-like bumps in the mouth or a rash on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Lesions will also usually appear at the back of the child's throat. Hand foot mouth disease is most contagious during the first week, so contact the pediatrician immediately after identifying any of these rashes. And lastly, there's roseola. Roseola, also known as sixth disease, is often seen in young kids between the ages of six months and two years old. It is very rare to see roseola in children older than four years old. Like fifth disease, Roseola typically starts with a cold, followed by a few days of high fever. These high fevers can trigger seizures. The fever is then usually followed by a rash of small, pink, flat, or slightly raised bumps. It shows up first on the chest and back, and then on the hands, and then the feet. Contact the pediatrician once you've identified the bumps. Given that all of these skin conditions, with the exception of eczema, are contagious, it is important to contact your pediatrician to ask for guidance to help prevent the spread. Now, here is a sample case study. Your child gets invited to their first birthday party. Excited, you send them off to celebrate with their friends. However, one to three weeks later, you notice your child scratching their skin. When taking a closer look, you see small red bumps all over their back. You know that your child is up to date with their vaccinations, so you're confused as to what this is. What do you do? The correct answer is to call the pediatrician, as this might be a mild case of chickenpox. Although somewhat rare, about 15-20% to 20 of people who have received one dose of the varicella vaccine, also known as the chickenpox vaccine, do still get chickenpox if they are exposed. However, their disease is usually mild. Catherine, when should I contact the pediatrician for physical in injuries that my child has experienced? Great question, Alicia. It's definitely very frazzling for parents to watch their children endure traumatic injuries, and the process of figuring out how to care for children under these conditions can be highly stressful. If your child has experienced a head injury, be sure to call the pediatrician if their pain or crying becomes severe, if they are vomiting two or more times per day, if they become difficult to wake or are evidently confused, or if they have a headache that lasts for over 24 hours. If your child has experienced a head injury, call 911 if seizure occurs afterwards, if they are unconscious for more than one minute, if they are confused or if their speech is slurred, or if they are experiencing major bleeding that cannot be stopped after de applying direct pressure. If you think your child has a broken bone, Call the pediatrician if the child is hesitant to use the broken part or if there's evidence swelling. It's important to know that it is okay to ice the area and observe it for any improvement. If there's no progression in healing, you can reach out to your pediatrician and they can guide you from there. If you think your child has a broken bone, visit the emergency department if the bone is crooked or sticking out or if they appear to have a physical deformity are unconscious or have experienced trauma to the head or neck. 
If your child has a cut or a skin lesion, you should call the pediatrician if the bleeding will not stop after applying direct pressure, if the area starts to look infected, this can be shown by redness or pus coming out of the lesions, if the lesion does not heal within 10 days, or if the child is not updated on their immunizations. If your child is not updated on their immunizations, they may need a tetanus shot. You should call 911 for cuts and skin lesions if your child has a known bleeding disorder or if you cannot stop the bleeding on your own by applying direct pressure. So now we're gonna read some scenarios and you can think about them and then decide whether or not it's appropriate to call the pediatrician. Your six-year-old daughter slipped and fell down the stairs. She tumbled down and hit her head against the railing. She has minor bumps and bruises on her body, so you have her rest on the couch. A few minutes later, you notice she is having trouble staying awake and is confused. Do you call the pediatrician? The correct answer in this situation is yes. Since the child has hit her head, it is important to keep her under close supervision and monitor for any changes in her behavior. When a child has a head injury and then has trouble staying awake, it can indicate a serious injury. Once the parent observes that the child is having trouble staying awake, they should contact the pediatrician. This will then allow the pediatrician to have them come into the office to be evaluated and make sure that they do not have a serious head injury. Okay, now for another example. Brandon is an eight-year-old boy who developed an open skin lesion due to scraping his arm while playing basketball. There is pus oozing out of the lesion. What should Brandon's parents do? In this situation, Brandon's parents should call the pediatrician. Pus oozing out of the wound may indicate infection that needs treatment to prevent it from worsening. If this is left untreated, it could spread and go to other areas of his body. Another scenario is, your five-year-old son was running outside on the pavement and tripped on a rock and fell. At first, he was crying and didn't want to get up, but as some time passed, he began playing again. Should you call the pediatrician? In this situation, it is not necessary to call the pediatrician. The child began to play again and seems to be doing fine. You can keep a close eye to make sure there are no lingering symptoms associated with his fall. Canavan, is it valid for me to call the pediatrician if my intuition tells me that my child is unwell? That's a really great question, Catherine. Intuition is the instinctual voice in the back of your mind telling you that something significant really happened, whether it be good or bad. The reality is that you, the parent, are the expert on your own children. You are the individual constantly monitoring your child's behaviors and learning them inside out. You are accustomed with their facial expressions, limits, sounds, and boundaries. This means that you are often able to know when your child is off. So it is completely normal for you to feel as a parent anxiety, stress, or concern regarding the health of their children when something is off. And I recommend that you trust your gut and you call the pediatrician. So to answer your question, Catherine, it is completely valid to call the pediatrician if your intuition is telling you something's off. Here's a scenario to show parents' intuition and when it's appropriate to call the pediatrician. Imagine your child has been coughing for over two weeks. At first, you think it is just lingering symptoms from their cold. However, you start to get concerned because it is not improving. Your friend tells you not to worry about it and that kids are always sick and colds are going around the school. At first you think she is correct, but you begin to question whether or not you should contact the pediatrician. What would you do in this situation?
So in this case, the parent decides that their child's cough is not improving and they call to make an appointment with the pediatrician. At the appointment, the pediatrician diagnoses the child with pneumonia. The mother's intuition was correct and she knew that her child was not improving. In this situation, she made the correct decision to get her child evaluated and ended up preventing a worse situation from occurring since the child did get diagnosed with pneumonia. So here is another scenario. Your child has been falling asleep multiple times throughout the day and during meals. This is not a normal behavior for your child. Your husband believes that it is just because your child started school and is not used to being so busy throughout the day. While you think this is a possible reason for your child's sleepiness, you are still concerned because it is such a significant change from his normal behavior. What would you do in this situation? In this scenario, the mother decided to call the pediatrician and bring her child in for an appointment. She was concerned because the behavior was not normal for her child. The pediatrician evaluated the child and did not find any abnormalities. The pediatrician stated that it was probably just exhausting for the child to adjust to a new schedule. Even though there was nothing wrong with the child, it was still acceptable for the parents to call the pediatrician because it is better to be safe than sorry. It never hurts to get a second opinion, especially when you know your child is acting different than normal. As we said, it's always best to trust your gut and prevent anything bad from happening in the future with your child. Okay, so the last case study we have for intuition is, imagine you are a new parent. This is your first child and you're doing it all alone. It's the first week home after the birth of your baby and it has been everything but easy. Your baby has been crying nonstop. You know that that's what babies do and how they communicate, but you also know that there is something off. This isn't how your child behaves. Even though it's only been a week, you know that there is something wrong in your gut. You question if it's worth calling the pediatrician because you don't want to seem like a clueless parent. So what do you do? The correct answer for this situation would be to call the pediatrician. Although the answer is most likely colic, which is periods of distress in an otherwise healthy baby, you should always rather be safe than sorry. Thank you for taking the time to watch our presentation regarding when it is the appropriate time to call your child's pediatrician. I know that there was a lot of information covered, but my group and I hope that we were able to present the information in a way that was easy to follow. Obviously, parenting is a full-time job and requires a decent amount of effort. We realize that a majority is left up to the parents to learn and figure out for themselves. My group and I hope that through our presentation, we were also able to relieve some of the stresses associated with parenting. I know that calling the pediatrician seems like such an obvious and easy answer, but I know that also sometimes the scenarios aren't always clear cut. I hope that through the example case studies presented, you guys were able to gain more knowledge on this topic. Once again, thank you for your time and feel free to let us know if you have any other questions that we can help answer.